Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A con game goes bad, leaving one person dead and three injured. A bank executive is the target of a bizarre kidnapping. Let's get back in the car. His abductor demands three million dollars. Strychnine kills a successful Texas woman. Police believe the murderer is someone she knew. And after years of investigation, several unexpected tips lead to a conviction in the murder of Martha Moxley. These are stories you won't want to miss. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Arlington, Texas. The friends and family of 43-year-old Patsy Bolton Wright mourn her tragic and unexpected death. Well, she was so alive, she was so healthy. There was nothing wrong with her. When it happened, you're just in awe because you would never, ever have expected that to happen to her. There's not a day that goes by that, that we can even believe that this has happened. We can all I still see Patsy coming into the room smiling, and we can hear her laugh, and it just doesn't seem real at all. After Patsy's memorial service, a routine autopsy is performed. The lab technician checks for 56,000 foreign substances in her blood. Suddenly, the machine goes off the chart. Within seconds, the substance is identified. Strychnine. Because of its horrible side effects, strychnine poisoning is a cruel way to die. It's also a very rare way to die. These facts make Patsy Wright's death even more suspicious. The morning of Patsy's death, a frantic phone call woke up Steve and Sally Horning. Hello? I need to talk to Sally. Patsy, what's the matter? I can't breathe. The call was Sally's sister, Patsy Wright. Hello, Patsy? I took some cold medicine. Something's really wrong. What's the matter? What is it? We got to the house and went up to the front door. And of course, the door was locked, and uh, we couldn't get in. Patsy! She tore in the back! Patsy! Open up! It's Sally! I went around to the side. The window was open, I suppose, for getting fresh air in there. Opened it up, jumped through the window, came through, and I saw Patsy on the bed. She's in the bedroom! When we got in, she was in the bedroom. She just looked like she had kind of fainted. So I thought that's what had happened. So we tried to get her up, and that didn't okay. work. We need an ambulance at 3017. Home walk in Arlington immediately. Patsy, My sister's on. not breathing. I worked on both her heart and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. During that, a lot of green fluid came up. I would continually spit that out onto the bed, or there was a towel there, as I remember. Sometime after that, the medics came. Okay. When's the last time y'all talked to her? About 3 o'clock this morning, and she just stopped talking to us. We think the phone dropped, and we rushed over here as quick as we could. This is what y'all like found? This. Yes. I rode to the hospital in the ambulance with her. They said that they were not able to save her, and there just wasn't anything they could do. At first, no one suspected foul play. But in her phone call, Patsy had mentioned taking cold medicine, which was later found to contain huge amounts of strychnine. Authorities ruled out product tampering or suicide. Patsy had everything to live for. 
she had two children. She and her sister owned two wax museums worth millions. Also, Patsy had just bought three quarter horses and planned to train them herself. Texas police believed Patsy had been murdered. Two clues suggested her killer was probably someone she knew very well. First, the burglar alarm had not been set on the night she died. And second, only those close to Patsy knew that she took nighttime cold medicine before going to bed. I can pretty much say that this case involves someone that knew Patsy, knew her habits, and then I have to put together motive and opportunity. Money was a possible motive. Patsy's wealth came from two wax museums she owned with her sister, Sally Horning. When Patsy died, the museums were inherited by Sally and Steve Horning. We as family members were being asked questions that you never even think you're ever going to be asked. A straight nine in Patsy's cold medicine. No. Authorities felt that if Steve had poisoned Patsy, he would not have used mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to try to save her, taking potentially deadly liquid into his own mouth. Steve and Sally Horning, along with other family members, all passed polygraph tests. Police also gave Patsy's former boyfriend, Leo Fikes, a polygraph. He was one of the ones that would have been close enough to her to have known about her taking the liquid cold medicine on occasion. He was very much in love with Patsy, but she did not want to get remarried. Do you know for sure who caused Patsy to be poisoned? No. In realizing that I was a suspect, I think the most difficult part of it for me was that Patsy had rejected me, and we had not been real close for seven or eight months prior to that. Leo Fikes passed his lie detector test. Patsy's ex-husband, Robert Cox, was also questioned by police. Patsy had obtained a restraining order against Cox during their separation. I had some people give me statements that Patsy had some fears of her ex-husband, Bob Cox. I understand that there are times that Patsy believed that Bob Cox had driven by or parked close to her house. We knew that Patsy was going to be testifying against her second husband in an upcoming civil suit about a arson fire. We knew that he had called her on a number of occasions and uh, asked her to change this or that story, and she had told him that she was going to tell the truth. He was offered a polygraph test, and uh, he refused to take a polygraph test. Robert Cox says that he is innocent, as does Leo Fikes. But it appeared that someone had been with Patsy the night she died. Investigators found two dinner plates next to Patsy's bed. It seems unlikely that Patsy would have spent an intimate evening with either her ex-husband or her ex-boyfriend. Could there have been an unknown visitor that night who was familiar with Patsy's personal habits? Then, the day after Patsy died, her daughter, Leslie, received a strange phone call. I said, hello, and this person asked for my mother. And I said, well, she's not here right now. You know, can I take a message? And this person persisted in wanting to talk with her. She passed away yesterday. She said something to the effect that, well, good, I wanted her dead. I don't know if it was a prank phone call, if it meant something. Maybe somebody wanted to find out if she had died by taking the cold medicine with the poison in it. You know, it could be totally unrelated. It could be related, I don't know. It's frightening because we do know that somebody knew her very well and knew her habits and was close enough to her to know how to get in and to, to use that cold medicine. And we, we are afraid that we do know the person pretty well. We obviously have to know them just because we are such a big part of my mother's life that we knew most of the people that she did know. And it's hard just because you don't really know who to trust anymore. The strychnine that killed Patsy 
was in pure powder form, the most concentrated type of the poison available. Very few outlets sell strychnine, and all sales are controlled by the federal government. Authorities hope that someone will remember a suspicious sale around the time of Patsy's death. If you have any information that can help solve this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Give me your arm. Next, he doesn't look like your typical kidnapper. Have you got the note? And he isn't. I don't know what you're talking about. The FBI calls it one of the most bizarre kidnappings ever. The suspect was an overweight, middle-aged man with thick glasses and a floppy rain hat. Hardly the profile of a dangerous criminal, but dangerous he was. Minneapolis, Minnesota. John Grunhofer, a wealthy businessman, was on his way to work. John was the chairman and president of First Bank System. In the past year, he had saved the bank millions by cutting nearly 2,000 jobs. As John arrived at work, he had no idea that he was being watched. John, you're gonna have to go with me. Just get back in the car. Well, there must be some mistake. I have no business with you. I think you do. This is Carl, and you are going with me. What do you want? John and kept his cool. Just do as you're told and be quiet. <laughs> the commotion drew the attention of a witness. And I looked over and saw two men rolling on the ground. It was at that point I thought there was a, a mugging going on. So I started to run over there to help whoever was being mugged. And I got about halfway there when the gentlemen had both gotten up and started to act like they knew each other. And so I'd slowed to a walk. You need some help? You better get out of here. At first, it seemed so unreal that I, I almost laughed at the gentleman. And then I realized it was real and I was in danger. And at that point, I was terrified that I was going to be shot. And I then ran to the elevator. Just back up and get us out of this garage. The gunman ordered John into the car. It had been just three minutes since he entered the parking lot. Albert, do you want me to drive? Just head east, just head towards Wisconsin. Hey, give me your arm. Well, what do you want with it? Give me your left arm and shut up. You see, to avoid any further difficulties, I'm gonna attach this dynamite to you. That way, if you give me any other problems, all I've got to do is push a button. I think his intention was to frighten Mr. Grunhofer sufficiently enough that he would be very compliant and, and do what he was told to do. Someone in the garage found what the FBI thinks was the kidnapper's cheat sheet. It was a list of demands for his victim. I believe that the kidnapper is not really a professional criminal. It would seem to me that if you're going to commit that kind of a crime, you could basically uh, do it off the top of your head, if, if you will. About a half an hour later, the kidnapper entered Wisconsin 35 miles from Minneapolis. Who takes charge when you're not around? That'd probably be some Vice President? Does Scott Taylor take over? You know Scott Taylor? Never mind. The kidnapper ordered John to pull into a secluded rest area. When they arrived at the wayside, the kidnapper handed Mr. Grunhofer a note. Mr. Grunhofer then made a phone call to his secretary, who transcribed the ransom demands. I am a hostage of a group called Parents Against Drugs. The demand was for $3 million, $100, $500, and even $1,000 bills. Once again, the kidnapper showed he was an amateur. $1 million in 100s, $1 million in 500s, 
and one million. A professional 000. criminal would never ask for a thousand dollar bill. You don't exactly take a thousand dollar bill and go to a, a convenience store, buy a cup of coffee, and, and ask for change. Officials at First Bank System began preparing the three million dollar ransom. About the same time, the kidnapper discovered that he had lost his cheat sheet. Have you got the note? What note? The note from the parking garage. The kidnapper I became really about. upset. I used a note before, I've written a few things down. Are you sure you didn't take it? He forced John down a hill in a remote wooded area. Hold on. I got a rest of it. The kidnapper was so out of shape, he had trouble following. Finally, the two men reached the spot where a sleeping bag had been left in a plastic bag. Right there. The gunman moved quickly. He took off the bomb, he tied John's hands with a nylon rope, and forced him into the sleeping bag and taped his mouth shut. It took John only 20 minutes to free himself. And when he saw that no one was watching, he went for help. He called his office from a nearby farmhouse. The kidnapping made headlines throughout the Midwest. 10 days later, the FBI set up a hotline and published this composite drawing. The response was immediate. Two different callers identified the kidnapper as a man named John Henderson. Henderson was a maintenance worker who lived 25 miles outside of Minneapolis. He had never worked at First Bank System and had no apparent connection to John Grundhofer. I was stunned when they started questioning me about a kidnapping case that had just happened. Did you ever get over to Minneapolis, John? They wanted to search, and I told them to go ahead. I had nothing to hide. And they searched my car and my garage and the house. The FBI found no physical evidence that connected Henderson to the crime, but they asked him to appear in a lineup. Can I hear number three say it again, please? Three, step forward and say the line again. This is Carl, and you are coming with me. Do you see the man who kidnapped you in the lineup? It's number three. You know he identified me. I know I didn't do it. It's number three. Despite John's positive identification, Jeff Rasmussen, the eyewitness in the garage, did not pick Henderson out of the lineup. What's wrong? This doesn't concern you. The FBI continued to look for evidence. Uh, now, we need to get a sample of your handwriting. So uh, grab a piece of paper and a pencil. A handwriting sample did not match the note. There was a grand jury investigation, but no charges were ever filed. John Henderson is no longer considered a suspect by the police. So far, the FBI hasn't found anything, and they won't find anything because I didn't do it. John. Who was John Grundhofer's kidnapper? Have you got the note? We may never know. What note? The note from the parking garage. The three million dollar ransom would have been the largest in Minnesota history. It was never paid. Coming up, it looks like an accident, but it isn't. It's a deadly insurance scam. Previously, we brought you the story of the tragic murder of 15-year-old Martha Moxley of Greenwich, Connecticut. The night before Halloween in 1975, Martha did not come home from an evening out with friends. The next day, her body was found in the Moxley's yard, hidden under a tree. She had been brutally beaten and stabbed to death. Nearby, investigators found the murder weapon, a broken golf club. 
Here are the clubs you requested from that set. It's the only set like that that we have. The club belonged to the Skakel family, who lived across the street from the Moxleys. Rushton Skakel is a brother of Ethel Kennedy, Robert Kennedy's widow. 15-year-old Michael Skakel told police he had been with Martha the night of her murder. His brother, 17-year-old Thomas Skakel, was with her too. Thomas, in fact, was the last person thought to have seen Martha alive. It's frustrating to know that for 20 years, they've known that they lied and they know something that's going on. Um, and I'm not saying that they did it, but they know something that could help us. Update. When Michael Skakel was 18, he was sent to a school in Maine for troubled teens, the Elon School. After the showing of Unsolved Mysteries, several of the young people who had attended Elan and were there with Michael Skakel called to say that they had known Michael there and that they had heard Michael confess to killing Martha. The tips were turned over to the police and also to former Los Angeles detective Mark Furman, who was writing a book about Martha's murder. The tips from Unsolved Mysteries were so important because it gave me one of the witnesses that actually heard Michael confess to the murder. Very pivotal because now you had somebody that's stating who the suspect is. No guessing, it's Michael. For more than 20 years, Dorothy Moxley waited for a break in her daughter's murder case. An investigative grand jury was called and found that there was enough evidence to indict Michael, and he is going to be tried in adult court for Martha's murder. A jury convicted Michael Skakel of murdering Martha Moxley. He received a sentence of 20 years to life. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. As a result of the Skakel family appeal, the verdict was overturned and Michael Skakel will be retried. After posting bail, he was released from prison. Los Angeles, California. It's a frightening scene. Emergency workers try to free the occupants of a car which had been rear-ended by a big rig. In this case, on Interstate 5 near downtown Los Angeles, the driver of the car and the passengers are rescued. A third passenger is pronounced dead at the scene. What makes this tragedy even worse is that it may not have been an accident at all. Authorities believe it was part of a carefully planned insurance scam that backfired. It's called swoop and squat, and here's how it works. A typical operation involves two or three cars. They cruise the highway together searching for a victim. Trucks are a favorite target among uh, swoop and squat rings because one, they know that trucks will have a lot of insurance, and two, that there'll be a lot of damage which is compensable by the insurance companies. The action happens very quickly. First, the squat car, usually filled with passengers, gets directly in front of the targeted truck. Then a second car pulls alongside the truck, boxing it in. The driver of the squat car may try to distract the truck driver. Finally, the swoop car appears and makes its move, forcing the other drivers to jam on their brakes. Immediately afterwards, the people who are in the squat car will then claim injury Injuries are almost always soft tissue injuries because they're so difficult to disprove. Uh, they'll exchange insurance information and then uh, a couple of days later, the attorney makes the claim. We've had one situation where two attorneys made over $9 million from a two-year period of time from simply buying stage accidents. The ringleaders of the swoop and squat are often attorneys far removed from the accident scene. Each accident can bring in up to $20,000 in false claims. A large part of it goes to the attorney. Those who risk the most in the con are paid the least. 
The people who are in the swoop and squat uh, accidents as passengers or drivers may be paid as little as $250 to $300 uh, to risk their lives in that accident. Usually, a middle man called a capper looks for people who are willing to do almost anything for money. Cappers may get approximately $1,500. All the money is made by the professionals who are, are corrupt, uh, the attorneys who are, are financing these stage accident activities. The crash on Interstate 5 had all the signs of a classic swoop and squat. But in this case, informants were willing to talk. They led police to a man who organized the operation, Philemon Santiago. Santiago was a Mexican national who lived in West Hollywood, California. A search of his apartment turned up documents connecting him to Beverly Hills attorney Gary Miller. Investigators obtained search warrants for the law office of Gary Miller. Evidence was seized, and, and ultimately, the uh, grand jury in Los Angeles County indicted Gary Miller and 29 others for numerous charges of insurance fraud and murder. Update. Gary Miller was tried and sentenced to six years for fraud and conspiracy. He received a concurrent sentence for manslaughter. Philemon Santiago was arrested in Houston, Texas. He was convicted of vehicular manslaughter with gross negligence. Next, a wife searches for her missing husband. She's convinced he doesn't remember who he is or where he is. Clintonville, Wisconsin. Christine Reinhardt's husband, Craig, is missing. Her search becomes an all-consuming quest. Hi. Uh, my name's Christine, and I'm out here uh, searching for my husband, who's been missing for quite some time. Uh, his name is Craig Williamson. Christine's search began in Colorado Springs, Colorado, at the motel where her husband was last seen. OK, Ms. Reinhardt, this is where your husband stayed in room 112. Over there on the chair was his luggage. It was unpacked and open. The bed was made. It looked like it was not slept in. It looked like someone just left and walked out. It is now my pleasure as an ordained minister and by the power vested in me by the state of Nevada. Craig was almost 46 and Christine 41 when they married at Lake Tahoe. Craig, let me kiss your wife. They had known each other for only a month, but it was definitely love. Christine still speaks of their marriage in the present tense. I think the thing about Craig that is most endearing is his caring and nurturing attitude toward me. He's just wonderfully supportive, very loving. Craig and Christine bought a farm in Wisconsin and began to raise exotic fish called tilapia. Do you have them on oxygen today, dear? Yep. Any reason? Craig rigged an old school bus to transport the fish that he was planning to sell. He loaded up and set off for Colorado. Christine was concerned because Craig had suffered a concussion just four weeks earlier. If I tried to rub his head, he said, honey, don't do that, it hurts. And so I knew he was still suffering from it because he would still, um, I'd say, do you have a headache? And he'd say, yes, you know, but he wouldn't admit it, but I'd catch him taking aspirin all the time. In Colorado Springs, Craig rented a car to use for business. At 9 p.m., the night before he was to return home, he and Christine spoke for the last time. Craig was 1,000 miles away from Wisconsin when he disappeared in Colorado Springs. The next day, his credit cards were discovered in El Paso, Texas. Craig's rental car was found in Juarez, Mexico, just across the border there were no signs of foul play. Detective Robert Johnson headed up the investigation in Colorado. This is the area where we found the bus still parked when okay. we came out the day of the search. Uh -huh. And what I wanted to show you is some of the things that we found 
that the bus was still parked kind of along this line here. I truly believe that Craig walked up to his rental car and that someone came up behind him and hit him on the head. And this is completely in, in keeping in character with Craig, is that he'd get up and wouldn't go in and say, I'm hurt, help me. He'd think, I have to get on with things. I, you know, I have to be doing something. I'm supposed to go somewhere. I have to get back. And he would wander toward the bright lights of the uh, parking lot and then the interchange. And he wandered off from there. Over the past week, Williams' wife, Christine. Television stations in Wisconsin and Colorado covered Christine's story. When I saw him on TV, you know, I recognized him. And I said, that man was on the train that I was on. Two weeks after Craig disappeared, Judy Inman was traveling from Montana through Washington State. She said she saw Craig looking dazed and disheveled. When he first got on the train, these two drunks, they just kept harassing him. He kept talking about this fish that he had to go pick up. He was talking about this big building that had these big, huge tanks in it where they kept the fish. That man definitely had something wrong with him. And I knew that he definitely had some type of a head injury because I've taken care of patients like that. I got to get back to the fish. I knew that that was Craig. I knew it. And I packed up everything that I would need, packed up a suitcase for Craig in the outside chance I would find him, and went to look for him. Christine followed Judy Inman's train route from Whitefish, Montana, to Portland, Oregon. She photographed every train station along the way. Christine then met Judy and so showed her all the photos. There. There's really nothing much around there. It's pretty empty. Then there's this That's one. It, sir. You think this is the one? That's just the one where he got off. The station was Wishram, Washington. Christine believes Craig might have mistaken Wishram for Washakal, a town where he had once lived. Craig's son plastered the area with this poster, but no new clues surfaced. I will never give up. I will just constantly look for him. I know he's alive. And I know someday I'll find him. The trouble is I don't know when. Update. After seeing himself on our broadcast, Craig called Christine from Key West, Florida. He was now going by the name of Ron. He said that he had lost his memory when he was beaten and robbed by two men. The phone rang, and he said, hello, Christine, this is Craig. And it didn't really sound like him. He sounded like a shell of himself. It, 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 from what phrases he used and things like that, I knew it was Craig. But his voice was really, oh, very weak. And, uh, and I was just shaking. I was, I was in total shock. Craig said that all he could remember was that he had been attacked by an unknown assailant in Colorado Springs. What followed were two years of painful headaches, blackouts, and amnesia. When I saw this whole thing on Unsolved Mysteries, I realized that I was Craig Williamson, but I didn't know who Craig Williamson was. I didn't have a clue to who he was. I knew that he had a family someplace. Um, I knew that he was married. I didn't know that he had a fish farm. I didn't know a lot. He and Christine met in Colorado Springs, hoping that it might help jog his memory. Does that look at all familiar to you? It doesn't, it doesn't, it looks familiar from the Unsolved Mystery segment, but nothing. it doesn't, I've, there's nothing here. I feel nothing, no attachment to it, so no, it doesn't. In the end, Craig remembered nothing. And the reunion Christine had long dreamed of ended in a bittersweet party. We've decided it's best for us to go our separate ways and still be friends and we still love each other, but, but we're not the same people that married. I'll take care of yourself, okay? I will, too. Take care of yourself, too. Everything I've done has been worth it. The search, 
all the effort that I put into trying to find Craig was worth it. I would do it all over again, and I can't imagine doing it any other way. Next, a man considered brain dead makes a complete recovery. Was it medical science or divine intervention? The power of prayer. For centuries, people have believed that through spiritual devotion, anything is possible, even miracles. Could they be right? Sackett's Harbor. It was summertime. Linda Gordon, a divorced mother of four, was longing to meet a man she could love, a man she could marry. I was sitting outside my front porch, and I was reading my Bible. And I glanced up, and I saw a man jogging. I had written in my prayer journal that I was, felt I was ready for a husband, and that if God wanted me to have one, to send him to my door. And then I called all my friends and family and said, I'm praying for a husband. And they laughed and said that the only guy I was going to marry that came to my door would be the pizza guy. This guy was not delivering anything. He was searching for love, just like Linda. I want to introduce myself. I'm, I'm David Shublack. I'm Linda. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. David Shublack was a major in the Army on temporary assignment at nearby Fort I've Drum. I've sitting here before. I just felt a warm glow and then goosebumps on top of that. And a voice spoke to my heart and said, this is the man you've been praying for. It was a match made in heaven. David and Linda were married just hours before David was shipped out to Louisiana. After that, Linda would join him in Arizona. Early one morning, David set off for his usual run. When the sidewalk ended, David ran along the shoulder of the road. He was headed east directly into a blinding sun. David was hit full force by a car traveling 52 miles an hour. He was thrown 60 feet through the air and landed headfirst on the pavement. Within hours, he was airlifted to Tucson. David had several massive skull fractures. Both of his legs and his left arm were broken. Your shoe blacks and cranial pressures continued to increase. Shortly after his admission to the intensive care unit, the normal functions of his brain just obviously were stopping. Major Shublak's intracranial pressure was really three to four times what we normally would consider a uh, survivable intracranial pressure in an individual. That pressure was causing David's brain to swell uncontrollably. Dr. Smith told Linda there was little hope for his recovery. I felt like I was being sucked down a drain, and I wasn't going to allow that to happen. I wasn't going to lose hope, and I wasn't going to accept the negativity that the doctor was saying, even though it was true medical science. Mrs. Shue Black, David is clinically brain dead. You and your I had to get spiritually radical because things were getting very intense. I know these are difficult decisions. I knew in my heart that David wasn't dead. Linda turned to the Bible for inspiration. She was immediately drawn to the story of Lazarus. According to the Bible, Jesus brought Lazarus back to life after he had been dead four days. Linda prayed that God would do the same for David. And Jesus said, he who believeth in me, though he were dead, shall still live. And whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I did all I knew how to do spiritually. Medical science couldn't save David. They said he was dead. Money couldn't save David. Only God could save David. A few hours later, Dr. Smith went in to check on David's vital signs. I was amazed when I examined him that instead of maybe one or two primitive reflexes, he actually opened his eyes and started to look around. 
David? David, can you hear me? It was not something that we expected to see. Uh, it rather gave me chills up and down my spine when I saw all this. When Linda returned to the hospital, David's father was waiting with amazing news. Linda, now don't get your hopes up. What? But there was a flicker of response when the doctors checked David this morning. That wasn't a flicker. That was the flame of God. Linda, we'd like you to talk to David. We need to see if he'll respond to commands. Linda was convinced that David's vital signs were the miracle she had prayed for. Sweetheart, it's me. Can you move your left hand, David? <laughs> I knew that David wasn't going to die because when I met David, God spoke to my heart and said, this is the man I'm giving you, and you will have a long life together serving me. So I knew that uh, he wasn't going to die. To me, it was just a waking up from a sleep. That's all it was. It was just coming back into contact literally with life, but I remember nothing else. It was just like I woke up from a nap. Just months after he was given up for dead, David Shublak was discharged from the hospital. He has since made a complete recovery. Was David Shublak's remarkable return from near death just luck? Though he were dead, she'd still live. Or was it divine intervention and the power of prayer? I'm truly amazed every day at what happened to me. David, can you hear me? There's no way that a person cannot be amazed. Linda proves what moving a mountain calls for. <laughs> Determination and faith will do all things. I have never seen someone survive the pressure this high. The fact that he returned to normal function after that is remarkable. Is it a miracle? It very may well have been.